The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer to peer. What's up, boys? What's going on, man? Oh, buddy. How you doing? Good, good, good. How was the uh, the event? It was fun. Yeah, I, I mean, I was only there for like the last day, but uh, but it was good. Uh, I mostly go to those things just to say hi to old friends, um, less so than for the, the talks. Monerotopia, on the other hand, a bunch of smart dudes saying a bunch of stuff that, you know, that I only just barely understand. Oh, crap. Let me put the cell phone on. Sorry. Wait, what if, uh, event did you go to? Uh, it was the Greater Reset. Derek Bros has been hosting it for ah, I think, three years that's now. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's in cool. Mexico. Sounds super cool. Yeah, it was in uh, Moralia, Mexico, which is like cool. kind of halfway in between uh, Mex- Mexico City and Puerto Vallarta. They get a good crowd. How many people? About how many people show up? Uh, I feel like there was maybe three, four hundred people. Oh wow, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. good. That's pretty any, good. Yeah. Any, any Monero related conversations taking place? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, there's might even be a guy that can get you a uh, uh, a, a visa or a, a credit card, debit card, uh, straight for Monero for here in Mexico of all places. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of these other cards are um, are like they only work in the U.S. or they only work in certain countries, and like Mexico isn't one of them typically. Right, 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 right. Okay, and, so, and somebody's uh, solved that problem. Um, I don't know if they've exactly solved the problem, but like they've kind of <laughs> they, they kind of facilitating the it like, to a degree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure how formally official it is. Like, I think it's all within the scope of the lay, the law, but um. I don't think it's like advertised in, in a big <laughs> corporate fashion, but yeah, like a lot of people there use Moner- uh, use Monero. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I got to uh, maybe we'll get Derek Bros to come to the the next Monerotopia. That he he was great at the first one. I, it looked like he was having a great time. <laughs> um, up on stage, I think he enjoyed it. I think he enjoyed. Yeah, he it. travels around quite a lot. I think. Um, I mean, I think he's still got a pretty pretty lively schedule uh, for next year or this year body what do you what do you think is uh you think it's going to work out for you argentina buenos aires december oh i'm i'm definitely going to go there's no doubt what 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 date in december i'm guessing early december before It'll christmas be the, the first weekend in december and that's when la bitconf is going to be as well so la bitconf is from that thursday to saturday really they say sunday but last time they didn't do anything on a sunday it's just kind of like breakout like you know close down day um so we're looking to to do monero topia on the saturday and sunday so kind of yeah. overlapping a little bit and then sunday is when we'll have the marketplace going uh we're really close to being able to announce something because we think we found the venue it should be sh- super cool we're trying to essentially rent out an entire hotel um and then we'll have the oh you know, that would be really cool yeah everybody hanging out there we'll have the talks in there and then it'll be juxtaposed to the marketplace which will be outside which is like a you know not not our marketplace it's a pre-existing marketplace uh that we'll be next to and then the idea is getting you know over the next couple of months we'll be onboarding all the vendors at that marketplace so by the time we do monerotopia uh, everybody in the marketplace will be using Monero. So it should be yeah, cool. the place we had in Mexico. It was, it was cool. It was cool, but it definitely would be easier if like everyone was in like, it was like a, uh, I guess a more proper conference. Everyone was in the same place. It makes it easier for everyone to come together and, to uh, be, and, you know, be there closer. And cause some people are at different places in Mexico, like depending on where they stayed. Yeah, it's always a lot of uh, qual- quality bonding time, right? If we have like 50 rooms rented out in a hotel, people there from, I'm thinking everybody would, would come and stay Thursday through Sunday. Um, so then on like Thursday and Friday, they could go to La BitConf if they want, or maybe they want to be a speaker there as well, right? So if they're coming all the way down to us, they could go and hang out at La BitConf as well. And uh, so you're planning on running Maritopa right as the big conf is happening at the same time. Well, conf will be on Thursday and Friday, right? So people can go go to Lepic conf on those days, and then we'll start on Saturday. I see. Um, I so see. It'll be a little overlap. That's cool. That's the current plan. I mean, we'll see. We could adjust it a little bit, but uh, I'm excited. Thinking maybe we try to do like a hackathon too. Luke Luke uh, Parker had mentioned that at the last Monerotopia. He was getting all excited about that concept. 
And this would kind of be the perfect venue scene for that, because if it's everybody staying at a hotel for four days together, then people can kind of go off and work on their projects. Um, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, that sounds cool. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what would come of it, but it could be cool, right? If uh, people try to hack away and create some kind of little useful Monero app over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, it could be exciting. Um, yeah, definitely, I definitely plan on being there. All right, buddy, we'll let you we'll let you take it away with price. Just want to get that information out there. No, that's good information. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, let's see, guys, turn your make sure you're on you if you're on YouTube, make sure you're turning to uh, 1080p. Sometimes YouTube will downgrade you. Uh, and if you're on Twitter Spaces, you know, get on YouTube and check out these charts. They look cool. All right, so um, let's go. Let's let's start with the Monero price. Um, even though there's not a whole lot to talk about here. A um, little bit of signs of life, signs of hope. Let's uh, be weird and start with XMR Ethereum, which we've never done before. Uh, okay, so XMR Ethereum kind of broke down as we had we had talked about, um, and we said we really, really need this thing to stop now and then jump back uh, above these bands here. So normally what I'd expect is for the price to, um, to sort of encounter the lower standard deviation bands and then uh, stop and then kind of start going back down. At this moment, it's, it's actually gotten above them, um, although the bands have curled down, so... Um, I mean, it is kind of a precarious place to be. We, we, in terms of the ratio to Ethereum, that is not, not the U.S. dollar price. Um, so right now, I mean, we want to see a little bit more action to the upside. We really want to tag the top of this um, of these uh, orange bands right here, kind of like this area. Tagging the top of that area would actually be a really good sign that price is probably uh, relative to Ethereum going to end up stabilizing um, as opposed to going down again. So. Um, not out of the woods yet. This is still like a very dangerous chart in terms of the ratio. So, um, but you know, it, it is nice that we've had some recovery. Pretty much all of that recovery since since our price is large. Jumping in, are you changing screens right now? Because I think people are saying, uh... yeah, it's yeah. static. Oh, interesting. Uh, um, let me stop presenting, and let me present again and see if that fixes it. I mean, don't get me wrong; those charts are very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm sharing again. Okay, I'm yep, moving stuff. Now. Yeah, yeah, now you're, okay. you're dynamic. Excellent. <laughs> dynamic. Yes, I'm always dynamic, bro. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> no longer static. Just playing. All right, so um, all right, we'll, we'll take a quick step back here. Uh, Monero versus Ethereum. That's the chart we're looking at here. And all these colorful lines are what I call wave magic. They are standard deviation bands. The blue lines are upper standard deviations. Technically moving standard deviations, just like you have a moving average, right? The 10 day, the 50 day, the 100 day, the 1000 day moving average. Um, in this case, uh, we overlay all of them and this is what pops out. So unfortunately, YouTube doesn't quite give us the resolution to necessarily to always give us um, like the best, clearest view of these charts, but um, they look pretty good from my end. Okay, anyway, so um, just to recap, uh, we said that um, XMR versus Ethereum had kind of dipped down and jumped back up. Typically, what I expect is to stop in this kind of point and then um, continue the downslide. However, um, and, and it does happen where you will just like drop a low violently and then immediately come back up. So what I want to see is I would like to see price. I would like to see the Monero versus Ethereum chart get back to around this area and then um, and getting around to this area here where that yellow line is or just drew that. That would be a sign that um, you know we'll we'll probably end up finding a stable price uh, to Ethereum, um, whereas like we're still kind of at a precarious point where things could could drop back down, especially since these orange bands are already curling down. They are slightly, I mean, they're not they're not short term, they're not long term, they're kind of medium term. You'll notice that they've been forming for the past year um, since uh, since the beginning of 2022. So that's Monero versus Ethereum. Uh, Given what I think Ethereum is going to do and how well it's actually doing on layer two and it's like rollups and stuff. And yes, it's all custodial, at least for now. And whether they'll actually make that non-custodial is anyone's guess. Um, but at any rate, there's billions of dollars on that ecosystem. Ethereum actually has a layer two that's currently scaling. Um, and as long as custody is OK, <laughs> according to our good friends, the Bitcoin maximalist custody is an OK solution, um, you know, for uh, for layer two. So, um, you know, Ethereum's just like trouncing them. So uh, yeah, that's um, the reason that that uh, this this dip and bounce happened on the Ethereum versus Monero price was because of Monero's action um, on the U.S. dollar, which is basically, I mean, things crashed probably related to that whole delisting FUD. I'm guessing half this crash crash was manufactured 
um, or kind of made to happen to sort of supplement um, the, uh, oh no, they're delisting everything. Um, and we're kind of bouncing back now, right? Um, so this is a good sign. It's a good sign that like, hey, there's, it's it's going to be difficult to get the price much lower than these these very long term, um, well not very long term, but you know, uh, somewhat long term band structures here. So um, you know, and, and again, the big thing that happened with Ethereum was it pumped, Bitcoin pumped, right? Everything pumped with the ETF and the Monero, which is like stable coined uh, sideways the entire time, pretty much. So that's what these this big dip was made of. And um, I'll show more throughout the, the sh I'll show more throughout the presentation here, but I do think that. Um, I think it's very reasonably plausible now. I won't say it's like a high, high likelihood, but I think it's more likely than not that um, that Bitcoin and altcoins are going to make um, another run up here. It not not like a massive run up, but I think they're like they're just going to rebound um, at least close to the top side um, to their previous local high. So um, and then you can see Monero Bitcoin basically did the same thing, right? We had this kind of like V shape um, price structure. Typically, what I've seen on these kinds of V shapes, like when when this happens. What I typically see is a lot of this, right? You just see sideways ranging um, until some decision is made um, by the price to decide where it wants to go. Um, let's see, recovering a little bit on, again, also, you know, same kind of story, recovering again on the, uh, the XMR dominance. Um, nice little wick down there and then now moving up. Okay, uh, ho hopefully that could be kind of a bottoming wick there. And again, that's, um, as we talked about last week, that's, uh, the uh, head and shoulders pattern is, is has been invalidated here. Like we can't uh, we can't call this a head and shoulders anymore. There was like this this plausible moment where it was like almost about to confirm, and and then it just went the other way, unfortunately. So, well, what are you gonna do? Sad day, sad sad times there. Um, and we've got uh, so I put this on a slightly longer time frame. Um, we're looking at fifteen minutes times uh, two hundred and sixteen <laughs> increments. I don't know how much that is. Maybe I could do the math real quick. 15 times two. Crap. I hate it when I put my um my my number pad onto uh, onto lock. So that's thirty thousand two hundred forty minutes. Maybe this is not like the best thing to do on the show. All right, this is five hundred four hours of uh, of look back. So uh, basically, for the last week or so, um, really for the last like two or three weeks, overall, um, we've seen Poloniex do a lot of volume weighted divergence. I don't think I believe Poloniex volume, but maybe like, maybe it's like insiders moving their Monero around. Like, I mean, you know that these insider guys need to do shady things and you know that they need to use Monero. Like it, I don't think they like just completely hate Monero. I, I think they need to use it from time to time. Um, but they trade it on their own exchanges where they have agreements with each other. Like, Oh yeah, we're not going to freeze your account for all the, um, shady money laundering stuff y'all are doing or whatever. Um, that's, I don't know. Polo got taken over, I think, recently. Like they had like I keep getting these emails. Maybe it's Bit Bitrex. I can't remember which one. I think it's Bitrex. I think Polo is resolved. But Bitrex keeps telling me you have money and you just have to give us your personal identifying information. And I say, no, no, thank you. Keep the money, assholes. Unfortunately, that'll probably just end up in the government hands, but you know, whatever. Uh, okay. On to hopefully happier, happier things than that. Um uh, let's not look at the macro just yet. So um, I, I redrew some of the lines on the Bitcoin chart recently. Um, uh, basically tried to simplify it. The chart was too busy. It was just too noisy, too much junk going on. Um, so effectively kind of what we had, what you'll notice for a very long period of time, what we had is this, um, this sort of rising wedge action. And, um, man, from what I've seen the past, let's just say six months or more, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin just, they, they haven't seemed to obey very good, um, like, they, they don't seem to follow chart dynamics too much, or at least like pleb line chart dynamics, because a lot of these lines are pretty clear, uh, pretty clear to draw. What's interesting, so we kind of had this big drop down here and then uh, and then followed up against the line. It got above it, and, and then it now we're basically in this range. So one way I kind of think of this is like this area right here is sort of like, that's kind of like the, um, the trend. And we're basically back in that uptrend, right? We're basically back in that same trend. Or another way that you could draw this is instead of trying to draw, you know, connecting tops and bottoms, what you could do is just draw a center line through this all and say, okay, the current overall trend with um, with ups and downs, peaks and valleys, the current overall trend is basically uh, this line that I just drew. Let's highlight that. All right, that that uh, thick white line there. Um, so effectively, like that's Bitcoin price is just trending up, right? It's just trending up against that line. So um, we can also look at the total market cap. Um, 
This one, so I like the total market cap chart, at least the pleb lines. I like them a little bit better. It seems to be just following this nice channel um, for the most part, except for this little area down here. Um, I also like the way that it's di the dynamics of total have played out on the uh, on the wave magic. It just it's a cleaner chart. The Bitcoin chart is just much more dirty. And may maybe it was a mistake to kind of to disregard the total chart for a period of time. But you'll notice, OK, so we get up here, we come you know, to these longer term stand, uh, upper standard deviation. What's funny is you'll notice that, that these go back a very long way, like those these these standard deviation cluster that goes back um, for years, really. So um, effectively, right, it got into this to this range. And then you'll see that the moving average clusters is where it held support before moving up. Um, right now, this chart would definitely suggest and this is another reason why I think that there's probably more upside here over the next week or so. Um, is because like the wave magic on this chart is pretty clear. It does suggest um, getting to to this sort of like target area up here. Um, doesn't have to be exactly that time frame, right? It, maybe it's over here in April. Um, I, I do tend to think that like there's probably reasonably good upside potential here for the next let's just say month or so. Um, obviously with ups and downs and whatnot, but effectively it looks like that again that long term moving standard deviation cluster. Price is finding support there, and it seems like the next thing is for it to kind of bounce up here to this top side. So um, I don't think that this um, this wonderful price goodness action will last forever. Uh, I think that at some point, this is going to have to take a, a little break. Um, I, I do see the signs continuing to move towards a direction of not like a not, not a not a catastrophe, right? Not a meltdown, not a 2008, but maybe uh, maybe last year, uh, March 2023, right? I, I do see things. The dynamics are moving to a direction where like they're they're just gonna shift at some point. And probably there'll be some washout. Um if if a if a real if a real financial crisis does happen and it happens before the election, uh that that's probably because there's gonna be some changing of the guard, right? They're gonna they're gonna put Trump in instead of Biden. Um, and that would just be special. Um, I just don't it's hard for me to think that um Mr. Warp Speed vaccine is gonna do anything different than than what he did last time. Like he had every opportunity to um to do the right thing the first time. So I can't imagine why anyone would think he would do the right thing um, the second time around. Uh, but okay, we're not here to talk politics. We're here to talk price. So we're looking at Bitcoin dominance right here. And right now you'll notice that Bitcoin dominance has basically been oscillating around the long-term moving average cluster. So right where I'm drawing that yellow line, hopefully y'all can see them, all those white lines, uh, that those cluster of white lines, kind of faint, but... Um, that's the long, long-term moving averages, and you'll notice that price is just basically oscillating around that moving average point. And that's kind of what moving averages are supposed to do, right? They're a magnet for price. You're supposed to basically um, come back down and tag those moving averages. They're supposed to act as um, uh, as a trend point um, for price. So, um, yeah, right here we kind of had we we showed that um, net rising wedge, uh, and then kind of break down from that. Um, surprisingly, Bitcoin dominant still doing pretty good um, despite having broken down from that wedge. So uh, on this kind of action, I, I really do, I mean, I, you would expect that this should come back down to test something here, right? Like Bitcoin dominance needs to come back down to test this area or maybe um, this moving average cluster. And you'll notice they're actually pretty close to the lower standard deviation clusters as well. So, um, but overall, like, unless we're talking about the NASDAQ or the stock market or any of like the majorly supported um, and preferenced assets or charts, um, typically with uh, with the standard deviation analysis, you expect um, to, to come back down and test some important critical level before um, making a, another move, which could be to the upside or the downside. Personally, I think that the downside is ultimately in the cards for Bitcoin dominance. Um, I mean, just every narrative that they have has been shattered and crushed and hopes and dreams and everything. And people are realizing that and laser eyes are coming off of profile picks now um, and have been for a while. So the other thing too is that um, we, we've got this dynamic, so we don't we, we want to be really careful about like the dubious speculation of just overlaying previous action onto the current action. But one thing I do want to point out is that as we crossed 2020, so if you look down here, um, right this this vertical area, uh, right as we crossed into 2020, you'll notice that there was kind of like a, a Bitcoin peak in the dominance, and, um, and and then it just kind of bled out really almost for the entire year as altcoins um, performed pretty well and overall the markets performed pretty well. Um, uh, although we did have that, that uh, financial crisis. So, you know, and then obviously the, the rescue of that um, tells people to get leverage into the higher leveraged assets and the more risky assets. So, um, you know, maybe unless we get some kind of crisis, you know, and then, and then a, a response, right. Crisis response, uh, then perhaps 
you know, you wouldn't want to just overlay this chart. But at, at any rate, it does seem like it does seem like last year or last cycle during this period of time, we saw Bitcoin make a big rise, make a big move on the dominance and then kind of peak out and then sort of come down. And even without looking at the Z scores, you can you can tell that um, this sort of peak, peak, peak action right here, these three peaks right there, um, that that is like falling, um, uh, falling momentum. So maybe I do have the Z scores pulled up. Uh, no, I do not. OK, so um, and then uh, right now we can also look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Um, I'm I'm looking at Ethereum to be coming back into some kind of prominence. It, it's uh, it's sort of been on the back burner for a while. All the focus has been on the Bitcoin ETF. Um, you know, and it's it's interesting. We we did see very similar action with the ETF release as we did in 2021. Things were things moved up on the hype into it. Um, although it was nice of them to tell us this time that it was probably going to happen because last time. Last time they're just like price smashed up and then they're like, oh, yeah, we're approving the ETFs. It's like, OK, um, very few people were watching that news, but but OK. Anyways, um, so Ethereum during the time uh, that just happened here um, was not the focus. But now that that ETF has been approved, remember, there's already the Ethereum Grayscale Trust. Um, there's already the Ethereum Futures ETFs. Uh, so it, it just at least I think so. I'm pretty sure on the Futures ETFs for Ethereum. You know, don't quote me on that. I need to check. But at any rate, it does seem like Ethereum is going to be the next one. It's going to get in there. It's going to get approved. And like, it doesn't matter which way you want to come from this. Um, like, you can hate Ethereum all you want, but all the people that hate Ethereum are almost always like, "This is the this is the Illuminati coin, right? This is the World Coin. This is this is the corporately approved coin." Well, okay, if it's all those things, then it's going to get approved on the ETF, right? Like, be consistent in that position. Um, uh, people that people that uh, say those things about Ethereum. So just know that that will happen and ETH will probably get its own hype cycle. Right now, this is Ethereum versus Bitcoin, right? It fell. And then right here, um, so we've got like this this fall. And then now that Ethereum has kind of like established this base, it hit the very long-term support. And then it, it found resistance at those upper standard deviation, or sorry, lower, <laughs> the, upper, the upper area of the lower standard deviation bands. Man, that's a mouthful. Um, we kind of found uh, resist resistance there, and probably Ethereum will spend some time with some sideways chop and eventually come to the upside. Um, maybe it could do it sooner rather than later, right? It doesn't have to necessarily do it now. Like it could, it could definitely just rebound and then and start moving up. But overall, I think the bias on Ethereum versus Bitcoin um, is mo moderately to the upside, unless we get any kind of major failures. Another interesting thing you can see here is that um, that wick down, right? That big wick down was directly into a cluster of of moving averages. So uh, I do filtering on these charts because if I didn't, these charts would be covered with lines. So like there, there would actually be moving averages and standard deviations filling all of this space, all of this blank space. But but I do a filtering algorithm on it because um, it just it presents better. It's cleaner because um, basically those are just equidistant lines in these other in these blank areas. And they just they're irrelevant. Right. They just clutter the chart. So um, this is an easier way to see where the clustering happens. Uh, OK, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much. I mean, obviously, there's always a bunch of crazy shit coins to talk about uh, in, in cryptocurrency, but that's the big stuff. That's that's the overview. Um, oh, you know what? I did want to do one more look uh, at the relative prices. So, for example, total market cap. Uh, let's start with Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin's total. No, just Bitcoin price versus the Nasdaq, right? Um, BTC versus NDX or NQ1 in this case, which is the futures Nasdaq futures. Um which has longer trading hours. So right now at this moment, you would kind of think, um, you really would kind of expect that there's the potential for, for Bitcoin to come to the top side of this um, of this line here. So if, uh, if anyone was paying that much attention, they would notice that this line was drawn like this. And it's okay to redraw lines. Like, don't, uh, don't be afraid of redrawing lines. Just don't do it haphazardly. Don't just like constantly be redrawing, be redrawing lines. But to me, like with these wicks, this seemed like a pretty reasonable way to draw this line for a period of time. You'll notice that the first peak happened right at where you would expect it to. And that's where we had this line drawn for a long time. But the reality is that if we really wanted to draw the most shallow version of this line that we possibly could, right, which just connects to the tippy top of that of that wick right there, then you'll notice this line actually um, comes to sort of an intersection point with the upper standard deviation band. So uh, in reality, I would kind of be looking, oops, I would kind of be looking for um, the Bitcoin versus NASDAQ, right? For Bitcoin to outperform the NASDAQ for a period of time, um, maybe over the next, let's just say, three to four months, uh, and to try and get into this upper standard deviation cluster. Uh, that's that's also kind of what happened last time. Um, backwards, backwards. Um, that's also what happened last time. 
the timelines are a little bit screwed up because because uh, this top was in 2019, right? So instead of this massive quick recovery, um, you know, instead we've seen something that looks uh, more like that, right? It's it's been more of a gradual uh, gradual movement. And personally, I, I kind of like that. I think it's better. Um, I think it's better for price if it moves gradually to the upside as opposed to just shooting to the upside. Although the way that price has moved, the action for the past year has basically been like two days of mega pump, two, three days of mega pump, right? Like the pumps have all been on very short timelines. And then the rest of it is just down stairs, down sideways. Um, it, right. We, so it, even though we have been pumping, it's been in like the most scammy way you could possibly imagine, which is, uh, just special, but, um, anyways, that's Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ. Um, uh, I do think this chart would, would tend to suggest, uh, the opportunity for moving to the upside here that, that would be, that should be the next move. Um, and then the NASDAQ is also kind of encountering its own resistance points. Um, so we'll look at that in a second. And then this is total market cap, um, versus the NASDAQ. So same deal. You'll notice it's not nearly as like pumpy. It's not pumping quite as much, right? It's not as frothy as, as the Bitcoin versus NASDAQ chart. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I also think that this chart looks a lot cleaner than, uh, than the Bitcoin chart versus NASDAQ. So, um, and maybe, you know, maybe that's what happens here with Bitcoin is you just get this like vacillation of movement into Bitcoin and then pump the shit coins and then go back to pumping Bitcoin, right? Just money flowing back and forth inside the casino, basically. So, um, yeah, this chart also, um, would suggest the, the potential for moving to the upside. We've had some oscillation period here in the local um, standard deviation bands, right? That would be the blue bands there and the orange bands there. Uh, and by local, I mean like for the last year, right? Um, so now things are at the top side. They've moved to the top side, um, I guess maybe consolidating here. But uh, yeah, I mean, moving up to this area would definitely be a reasonable thing to expect from this chart. The chart doesn't hardcore say that like it's going to, but or, um, in terms of wave, wave magic, right? I'm not necessarily just saying, um, you know, uh, this is just one way of, of, of analyzing it. So, but in terms of like the wave magic, you would say this is a positive looking chart. It's not like insanely positive, but it's it's definitely positive. So um, let's go to the NASDAQ and I'll show you what a very, very positive wave magic chart looks like. Um, maybe that one too. Uh, that's right. I was looking at this on longer time frames yesterday. Uh, this kind of wave magic chart does look, does look pretty positive. Um, so this is the NASDAQ versus the S&P, right? Tech stocks versus, um, I don't know, more traditional, safer stocks, if you will. And obviously more risk, more reward. You get uh, you get better returns there. And the thing is now, I think the the broad the, the broad investment ecosystem, um, whether that be plebs, finance bros, home, uh, family offices, they all basically know now that it's a game of leverage. They basically intuit that it's a game of, of money printing. And so... Um, they just like people just know like the Nas the stocks always go up. They're always going to get rescued. So why would you hold the S and P? Move to the Nasdaq because um, they're going to rescue that shit every time, and it gets better gains, it gets better returns. So um, yeah, this chart is basically just like trending up. You'll notice that all of these bands are now moving to the upside. You'll notice like even the purple bands up here, which is where we really expect this chart to um, to go here. Um, this is a, a quite a bullish scenario here for for the S for the Nasdaq um, relative to the S and P in terms of the U.S. dollar price. <clears throat> in terms of the U.S. dollar price at this exact moment, um, let's look at it without wave magic to start. Uh, yeah, we're well above um, the previous all-time high, right? The, the previous one in 2021 uh, over here. And then um, after a little bit of oscillation, things have bumped up now to the higher side here. And, um, oh, I suppose that that these lines that were previously resistance will now become support, right? This This line right there. Um, probably I would expect to just think that this line over long, the long period of time, this line should just continue trending up here. Um, I don't know if we get that kind of a washout that we talked about some breakdown, um, maybe like five, six months from now, something like that. Um, if, if, if these, if, and when these signals start turning towards the negative, uh, and, and like actually show negative, um, like show, show us downside, then, okay, we'll, we'll kind of reevaluate this as a support line. But for now that this would be a support line. Um, all right, let's go to the, the wave magic on this thing. Uh, this is also like a very bullish wave magic scenario chart. So standard deviation analysis um, anal uh, chart. So effectively, right, price came up here, oscillated, came down. Man, that was so scammy right there. Like this thing broke down and it really should have continued going at least into the uh, moving average cluster. But it just like totally didn't do that. And um, I mean, I think that 
I think there's clear reasons for that. I think that liquidity was borrowed immediately from the um, the reverse repos. Uh, I think they they were able to come up with the liquidity to keep pumping this market. And um, okay, that's that's what they want to do. That's the game. They're gonna they're gonna pump the markets. All, all right. Um, so if that's the case, um, what we're really looking at here is long term and with you know with oscillation, but long term for this thing to get up to this purple band. And I mean, it could take another year or two for this thing to really warm up. Um, the stocks always go up, but you have to remember it's like it's it's a long game. Stocks are a much longer game in many ways than crypto. Although crypto has to be the long game too. And uh, <laughs> if you get caught in these big um, in these big washouts, right? You get caught at 2021. You get caught in 2017, um, and you're going to be waiting a while, right? You have time value of money that you're losing there. You're going to be losing it for like three years until you finally get that shit back. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean. The, these markets here are definitely the long game. Um, right now, you'll notice that price is encountering the short-term purple bands, and typically, like price can get above them, but typically, that's like a kind of a stopping point. It might be the case that stocks need to take a bit of a pullback here, maybe one last bounce to the previous all-time high, um, and then and then start moving up. But ultimately, um, I definitely expect that uh, our our new range here is is looks something like that, right? The new range for stocks looks something like that. Um, absent some kind of like uh, crisis, so uh, that's that's currently currently what stocks are looking like. S and P um, S and P is like basically the same story. We don't really need to look at that. Um, let's see. There's going to be a uh, Federal Reserve meeting on Wednesday or an FOMC press release. Jay Powell is going to tell us all about how wonderful um, they're doing and how smart they are. And uh, you know, I'm sure everyone will believe them. And you know what? They actually are pretty smart. Um, so don't underestimate your enemies. Uh, they're probably going to hold rates steady. Um, I can't see any reason why they would, you know, actually, I don't know what the, what the market forecast prediction is. If they do anything, they might bump rates by a tiny bit. Um, markets are pretty frothy, but inflation seems to be doing okay. Uh, at the same time, like their official numbers have, they seem like they're leveling out. Um, so they'll have to make a decision based on that. My guess is they'll probably just hold rates where they are. So um, it'll, what's important is the stuff, the forward looking statements that he's going to make. That's usually in most cases, the more important factor. Um, cause usually people basically already know what the fed is going to do, um, in terms of like what they're going to do with the rates. So it's, it's about what he says about the future and probably things like rate cuts. People want to hear rate cut, rate cut. Um, I was almost surprised last meeting that he mentioned the, the conditions under which they might consider a rate cut. Um, cause even saying that like really pushes markets up and really like kind of, adds fuel to the potential inflation fire. So it, I don't know. I just thought that was, was a bit weird. That was kind of irresponsible. So all the signs are starting to say now that they're, they're ready to irresponsibly pump these markets. So maybe that's the election cycle. Um, maybe one thing they do before big crashes now is they pump the markets like way ahead of where the charts say they should go. They pump the markets significantly beyond where they should be. They did this in 2019 before, um, but before the big crash in 2020, March, 2020, um, so that, that could be what they're doing here, right? They, they could be pumping markets so that when they fall, you know, it's, it's the, even though it might be 30%, it's like, well, that's 30% after making a 15% gain. So it's really not that bad. Um, so, uh, we, um, you know, we just, uh, we just gotta know that that's, that's what they might be doing. We'll try and stay nimble. Um, don't, don't hang on every word of the fed. You can trade those meetings. Sometimes it's fun to do that. I say, you know, if you want to put some tiny little amount just for fun and, you know, trade 10x leverage on some bullshit um, and, you know, make a drinking game out of it. Um, I don't know, maybe every time uh, that, that Jay Powell says inflation, uh, you have to take a, you know, take a drink or take a shot, something like that. <laughs> maybe we'll organize those spaces. That would actually be kind of fun. Um, okay, yet I digress. Uh, let's go to bonds, fucking bonds. Uh, so bonds right now, the red lines here are the, um, that's the overall yield curve inversion. So negative means we are inverted. We are basically moving towards the top side. If you look at this, to me, that looks uh, that looks a lot like um, that looks a lot like a chart that's uh, going to move to the upside. Like, I mean, can we, I, don't, I don't know if technical analysis really works on the inversion of the yield curve, but uh, but maybe. But this is this definitely you would call this a bottoming pattern. Um, again, long term though, right? We're, we're talking like May before March, May before this like really starts looking um, maybe problematic. So, um, in relation to bonds, and I think in like intimately related to bonds now are these reverse repos um, still kind of ticking down um, for the past week. Um, and we've got about $570 billion left in there. So we should just uh, continue as long as these reverse repos have funds in them, just expect that bias to be up. This is liquidity that they can draw on. So I, I also, I wonder, I asked myself, I, I feel like they were able to keep, 
yields up here at this level. They were able to keep the short end of the curve pegged pretty close to the federal funds overnight rate. And I think part of the reason they were able to do that was because of that reverse repo facility where uh, you, you basically get uh, the federal funds rate minus, uh, I think it's 0.15%. You get the federal funds rate um, just for sticking your money in there overnight. No risk, completely liquid. You get your money back the next day if you want it. So after those reverse repos run out, I start asking myself, are they going to be able to keep this? Um, are they going to keep be able to keep this yield curve pegged to the uh, to the interest rate? So um, anyhow, once those run out, I, I do wonder if this thing's just going to start <laughs> dropping to the downside. So um, okay, uh, not much else here to look at. Gold flat, nothing really happened there with gold. Uh, let's see, Dixie. Dixie's also still pretty flat. Nothing here. Uh, and this is going to be like an, um, until this thing actually moves somewhere, Dixie's going to be not much of a story for us because we basically expect the compression of the volatility to continue. We, we expect it to, its oscillations to grow weaker and weaker. So, um, that, that seems actually to be a common theme with a lot of charts, except for, um, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and, uh, and stocks right now. But, uh, most everything else does seem to be kind of, um, just in this, in this holding pattern. Uh, and the volatility is falling off. So all of that signals the potential for um, some kind of macro move here uh, coming up. The the reason we're looking at this chart, so this is also the NASDAQ. Um, don't worry about the NASDAQ. We're just looking at the global liquidity, which is in white, and then the U.S. liquidity, which is in green. You'll notice that the U.S. liquidity keeps rising. I tend to think these charts play off each other. As stocks go up, you have more reason, like, hey, we have a higher stock valuation. We can take more loans, and more loans means more liquidity, right? It means more money moving into the into the system, um, and so as more money moves into the system, you can pump that into your stocks. And as the stocks go up, uh, you can say, Hey, let's use our stocks to justify, um, taking out more loans. Um, we can use that to back more loans. So that's what I think is going on with this chart. Um, after kind of looking at this over the course of maybe half a year, um, which is kind of why in, in a longer term sense, you've seen this oscillation of where, uh, you'll get, you'll get a pump on the liquidity and then you get a pump on the stocks or first you'll get a pump on the stocks and then you'll get a pump on the liquidity. Um, situation and it's because they play off of each other and so this is effectively leverage if you ask me so um yeah i guess that's about it oil creeping up here almost 80 dollars. nothing nothing special um good i don't want to see high oil prices no one likes paying a shitload of money an arm and a leg at the pump um so uh yeah i guess um there's not really oh you know what else here um balance sheet the the u.s uh, federal reserve balance sheet it does looks like they've kind of um they've sort of leveled off they've stopped selling off their balance sheet Maybe that's because they're starting to get low on those reverse repos. It, it is interesting to watch that uh, as the reverse repos are starting to come up to that point where it's like, eh, what are we going to do, guys? They stop selling off their balance sheet. So, and that has been the case now since, uh, I guess, just since uh, January. So, just since the beginning of the year. You'll also notice that the M2 money supply is now ticking up as well. And this this is only recent as of December 1st. So, we don't have the the data from the last month and a half. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, M2 money supply is leveled off and it looks like it's starting to move to the upside. Um, so uh, all of this, like all of this currently spells more upside. Like it looks like upside in the short term. Uh, maybe stocks need to take a break here, pull back just a little bit, um, or trend sideways for a moment, but that's probably, again, if stocks are going to stop and, and pull back for the past six months, that has been like a crypto, um, like that, that has helped cryptocurrency prices. We've seen some kind of inverse correlation, a moderate inverse correlation between, um, between stocks and crypto. So if, if stocks are going to take a break, crypto might actually now take a run here. So that's kind of like the big picture. Hopefully I painted a, a clear enough picture there why I think that there's a, a decent chance that, that crypto goes for a short-term run here over the next weeks. Um, not a huge run. Don't expect Matt. I mean, some coins will, but um, overall, you know, may, maybe uh, move back to that upside, move to the local high, maybe even beating the local high. Stocks might take a little bit of a pullback. Um, and then uh, and what we're looking for is, is the finishing off of that reverse repo situation. Right, we're looking for this thing to finish dropping towards zero, um, and and we're also looking at those bonds to see um, if there might be some other tail risk event um, coming up for us. So um, yeah, that's that's the stuff we'll be looking at. Um, we're we're not out of the woods yet on tail risk type of events, um, but for the meantime, you know, the, I, I wouldn't be super concerned about that. So um, let's see, any questions? Should I be looking at the YouTube here? I'm so bad about that. Yeah, uh, people are. People are just debating whether or not it should be more Monero focused versus, uh, you know, the extremely <laughs> broad uh, covering you do. I mean, I, I can I can narrow it down. I don't have to cover like so much stuff all the time. We can like I can shorten this thing by like ten. Yeah, minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's I think it's a great overview. Um, 
but there's yeah, just the- like guys if y'all have something you want me to talk about in particular monero send me a chart right like say hey what do you think about this chart what do you think about this indicator what do you like like send me some stuff like some real stuff like that you that you want to see looked at because there's just not much i mean monero has been so stable for the last i don't know seven nine months like <laughs> what do you what do you want me to talk about there? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's only so much you could say about Monero, Monero's price, right? Which is like we don't like talking about it anyway. Um, no, I, th- I, I do have. You're... I do have this idea to um to look at Kraken volumes and see if we can correlate the volume on Kraken to the transaction. And I've had this idea forever. I don't know why I haven't implemented it, but compare the volume on Kraken mm. to the transaction counts, right? To the Monero transaction counts. Okay. Um, and if there's a correlation there, then to use um, <laughs> to like do some kind of like voodoo magic to estimate the uh, the volumes happening on Monero using Kraken as sort of a proxy. Oh, okay, interesting. So based on yeah, so- action count to try to figure out what the what the dollar value of, of volume is that's that's being transacted. Yeah, based- I mean, we might. Okay. It, it might have to remain a completely relative thing. Um, or we could try and make some estimation of um, like how much, how many transactions correlates to how much Kraken volume. And then we have to estimate how much Kraken volume is the total volume um, in but the it, Monero is, is ecosystem. That, are those two different, like the, the Kraken volume is just trading volume, right? Not correlated to transactions. It's just people trading Monero back and forth on a centralized yeah, like, that's why it would be. That's why you'd have to first correlate. So right here is the Monero volume chart, or sorry, the Monero volume, the Monero transaction count chart. Mm-hmm. So what we would do is take the Kraken reported volume of Monero and then see if there's a correlation. If there's a correlation to transaction counts, um, then we could probably use Kraken volume to factor in, um, like to what volume we think might be happening on the Monero chain. But only if there's a correlation there. Because if there's right. no correlation, then you'd say, well, then it's just people trading back and forth. Yeah. It has no correlation to the yeah. real Monero. It's, it would be interesting to look at. It might not tell us anything, but, you know. I mean, um, another way is, is, to, is to value the, the black markets, right? Yeah. And, uh, simply Which is also quite hard. Buy that by the Monero transactions. <laughs> yeah, just let me call up all the uh, darknet markets and ask them to, to send me a full reporting of their, yeah, it's their kinda, transaction kinda state. Hard. It's kind of hard. <laughs> it's, they should post it, right? They should post it on there. That would be awesome. Like if some black net or some dark net market yeah. was like, Show the hey, volume. we're, we're going to act like a regular corporation here and give you <laughs> quarterly financial reports. <laughs> like to yeah. just to do everything but reveal who they are. You would like follow all like, maybe not all, but you know, like all the generally good accounting practices and be like, yeah, we're just acting like a regular, regular company over here. I was saying, I do want to get somebody to pop in maybe once a month to give us the the update on what's going on in the in the black markets from a Monero perspective, right? Yeah, I, I never look at that. I I'm not like I don't think I really have the tools or the know how to estimate anything that's going on there. Hmm. Um, well, you know. I mean, you could see all of them are accepting Monero, uh, mostly Monero only, right? Yeah. Um, and then I guess funny. It's always a big debate between us and, and maximalists that are maximalists will be like, Oh, hardly anyone's using Monero. It's all, it's all still Bitcoin. Yeah, they offer it, but you know, and then we're like, no, no one's using Bitcoin anymore at all. I don't know when I, when I go check things out and you read, you read dread and you go and you, you, you check out all the, the recommended marketplaces that people, they all seem to be Monero based. So I don't really yeah. know. And then, and then I see all these criticism, like people warning people like about Bitcoin. Um, so I think I think it has shifted. I don't know who's still using Bitcoin on on black markets. I I, I don't understand what the mentality would be there. Like the information's out, and that there's there's no. I mean, I get liquidity, but I don't know. It doesn't seem like it would be worth it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not the best decision, but um. Are y'all going to cover the, so Finland's National Bureau of Investigation claims to have traced Monero. Is that on the, I didn't see the news list. Yeah, we have, we'll have that in the news. Okay, cool. I no, think it's an Eve, Alice, Eve situation. Yeah, yeah. Poisoned outputs and such. Yeah, that's, I mean, I assume that's what that is. But yeah, we'll bring that up in the news if you want to jump up and comment on it. Cool, yeah. Uh, well, I won't. Uh, All right, man. 
thank you so much. Yeah, definitely mm-hmm. stick around if you can. Uh, we're going to try to do a BTC to XMR atomic swap. That'll be cool. All right, buddy. All right. All right, guys. Thanks, talk to you later. President's financial advisor. <laughs> yeah. Talk to you. Until next time. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. <laughs>